Welcome to Friday Night Q&A with Andrew Carlson. We've got a nice group here tonight. I hope you got some questions. Or answers. So let's get started. You ready for a question? Sounds good to me. All right. Why does the Acts of the Apostles break off so abruptly? I think we actually answered that question in in one of our uh, Q and A's. Mm -hmm. I think we we uh, touched on that one uh, recently. Let's let's do a different one. I think. Okay. Let me bring up the text here. We did do that one. Yeah. I mean, we could we could do the same questions every time if you every want. Time. But, uh, <laughs> Non-written documents are not useful as primary sources in conducting historical research. Is this true or false? Um, I would just question the question in the first place. Non-written documents? <laughs> yeah, I'm a little confused with, with, what they're, with what they're asking, but... Uh... Do you think he means oral tradition? It could be. Uh, um, but, I mean, it could also be like, you know, there, there are some documents which are once existed, but they're lost. Um, you know, there's lost books of the Bible we don't have anymore. But what's interesting uh, is with some documents, we know the content enough that we could actually reconstruct a pretty good basis of the lost documents. Um, True. Give some, us one of your examples. You've done that many times. Well, so some texts are harder than others. But, for example, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a document called the Genesis Apocrypha. And in that document, it has a few different books from different patriarchs. Uh, we have the Lamech story, we have the Book of Noah, and we have a Book of Abraham. But the scroll breaks off the story of Abraham and doesn't finish the book. We have several sources which we can use to reconstruct the rest of the Book of Noah and the Book of Abraham. So, for example, um, who did, whoever wrote Genesis, be it Moses which I don't believe anymore, but, you know, some people believe that Moses wrote Genesis. Or someone later, like Solomon. I believe it may have been Solomon, perhaps. Um, but I don't know for sure, but that's just one theory I have. So um, whoever wrote it, they used earlier documents to get their information. They didn't just make it up. Some people think they just made it up, but I believe they had earlier sources. You know, some of it might be incorrect over time. They, they might have made mistakes, but overall... They got their information from earlier documents. And I believe the Genesis Apocrypha was one of the primary sources for the book of Genesis. If that's true, and, li and likewise, it's one of the primary sources for the book of Jubilees, because Jubilees actually tells us that it used the Genesis Apocrypha as its source. So with that in mind, we can then say, okay, the Genesis Apocrypha is missing these sections here. What was there? Well, what, what had to be there was the information found in Genesis for that person's life story. And what Jubilee says, both of them had to be in that document. So we can use Genesis and Jubilees, take the stories and put them into the missing places in Genesis Apocrypha and recreate, we can restore the missing sections of the Genesis of Arkham. Not perfectly, but we can have a good idea of what those missing portions said. So that, that's the process you can go through. And there's all kinds of other documents for lost books of the Bible where you can go through a similar process of reconstructing the missing sections or the whole book entirely, if the whole book is lost. What about, uh, what does Jubilees call the Genesis Apocrypha? Um, Certainly not Genesis Apocrypha. 
No, it uh, it refers, like you know how people call the five books of Moses as the Torah. They call five different books as a single grouping, the mm -hmm. Torah. Um, Jubilees doesn't do that with Genesis Apocrypha. It doesn't say all the patriarch books as one book. It each patriarch section has their own book. So Jubilee says, this is from the book of Noah. This is, uh, Abraham wrote a book. Jacob wrote a book. It, it says that each person wrote a book. Like it says Enoch wrote a book. So that's my understanding of how Jubilees refers to Genesis of Fun. It just refers to the fact that each patriarch wrote their specific book. Does it say like Moses wrote a book? Um, it doesn't say that because Moses hadn't written any books yet uh, when Jubilees was, at least when Jubilees claims to be written. Um, Jubilees was revealed on Mount Sinai around the same time he was giving the law for the first time. Uh, that's, that's the setting that the book gives us. So um, all the other books that are attributed to Moses would have been offered later in Moses' life. That's kind of your specialty, I think, you believe. My oh, I... We have a collection of Andrew's Jubilee's teachings. If you'd ever like to hear all of them, I think there are 18 of them. We did, um, we didn't finish that Jubilee series, but that's okay. Um, I mean, there's so much good stuff in the Jubilees, yeah. Um, I mean, and one of the things that I've been teaching people, which pretty much no one else has heard, you won't hear this from anybody else, but there is evidence from the Book of Jubilees that there was another Book of Jubilees, which is the source of the Book of Jubilees. So the evidence is that there was a Book of Jubilees in, the, in a very similar format that we have the Book of Jubilees today, there was a, an, another document called Jubilees, which was revealed to Abraham. And it, the angels came to Abraham and explained the scriptures to him and, went and did an overview of history in the same way Jubilees does with, with the angels talking to Moses. Um, I, I found evidence for that. But it's... it's um, Unless you really look closely, you don't see that evidence. Uh, most that's people. Like, um, that's just like the book of Jasher. We know certainly that the book of Jasher only goes back to about 1200, but we read in the scripture that there was also a book of Jasher. There's one of the lost books we understand. Uh, most people, I should say most scholars, don't think that the one that's we have goes back, well, they can only find manuscripts back to the 12th century. So, uh, and it is very much uh, added to, but it's very entertaining. But they don't think it can possibly be the same yasher that is spoken of in the scripture. So why don't you tell us about that a little bit? Do you think it's the same? Uh, I think it's the same, but that it's illegitimate. So basically, I think that the reference to Jasher was not originally part of the text and it was added very late in like around the first century AD time. So I think I think Jasher as we know it is a ancient document but only goes back to around the first century uh, in my belief. But most scholars would tell you that it's not anywhere close to that ancient. Most would say it's was invented uh, during the Middle Ages. But I, I think you, you could make a case I think there is some reason to believe that it does go back to the first century, but I don't think it goes beyond that. I'm trying to think of where it ends up. And I can. It's been a long time since I read that book. But I sure enjoyed reading it. That doesn't it go like an all the way up until the last the, Bible of Jericho? I, I mean, it goes, doesn't it tell? It goes, a, yeah, a little bit into the Judges or something. Yeah, yeah, it goes... Yeah, because I know it pretty much tells the story all the way through Genesis, all the way through Moses, all the way up yeah, until Judges. And it just so happens to disagree with pretty much every other apocryphal book. Yeah, yeah. Especially Jubilees. Like, um, 
you couldn't make a book that agrees uh, that disagrees more with Jubilees than Jasher. So, um, if someone wanted to write a book against Jubilees, Jasher would be a book uh, would fit that description because it's just completely contrary to almost everything Jubilees says. Let me ask you two Jasher questions then. Sure. What was the, which was the uh, son of the patriarch Yako whose voice could be heard for miles? <laughs> Jimmy in? Um, that, was, wasn't that, Ju was that Judah? No, Judah could, yeah. Judah, it was one of the ones you don't hear about much. Yeah, it could have been Simi, and I don't, I don't know. Um, but the, yeah, it, it attributes to the sons of Jacob a bunch of... Um, That's wild stories. Yeah, wild stories is a good way to put it. Uh, right, now, I don't, be, I don't believe that those wild stories are impossible, but it's just the way it presents it sounds more like, uh, what's the word, folk, uh, folklore type uh, thing. Sounds to me like it was something that was written on the bare bones of the Torah for entertainment's sake. Because there are really a lot of funny stories in there. Take that <laughs> one story about the first undertaker. What was his name? Ricky Owen or something like that? <laughs> Ricky Owen was the yeah. undertaker and then he became the first pharaoh? Yeah. That was a, a pretty good story. Guy trudges into Egypt, he has nothing. So he starts selling grave sites. And he becomes <laughs> so rich that he becomes the first pharaoh. Is that all? So what, what was, was someone going to say something? I was wondering if that was all on that one, if you want another question or talking um, sources. I, you talked before about the four source theory, the documentary hypothesis that came up on the chat. Yeah. We happen to believe that the first Torah writings were on uh, cuneiform. Just like, let me see, just yeah. like Emerson here says that it seems like, oh, wait a minute. Look, trying to find it. Oh, these are the generations of. Actually, I think that that ends the passage rather than begins. That's the end of the new page. And yes, we talked about this too. I'm not that uh, senile yet. Yeah. What else is said here? Someone's typing away. That's me, sorry. <laughs> it says that the Torah had five authors, Elohim being the first, then Adam and Moshe, who put the books together and added with Shemot. Now there was a theory not too long ago, that it wasn't a Pentateuch, five books, but there was actually a Hexateuch there. And that, let's see, Joshua was actually the sixth. And then there's a Enochian Pentateuch that Millick used to talk about, where he thought that the five and six books of Enoch that are packed into the first Enoch were all their own books at one time. And he's probably right on that, wouldn't you say? Because um, it's obvious that you've got different books in Enoch, first Enoch, different authors. They, you know, there's Book of Moses in there, I think, and some other ones. Book of, uh, was there a Lamech in there? Various. The, script, the scriptures have different redactions. Um. I would say for the Torah specifically, um, I believe in uh, basically, let's see here. I'm going to make, um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. All right, I guess it's five as well. Five different authors for the Torah. Um, so... Uh, so the so this is uh, what it is. So patriarchal authors. So that would be the original documents which are being used as source material. So that would be the Book of Noah, Book of Abraham. All those documents are 
have the actual text in the original words of those patriarchs. Um, then, so some of that may have been included in the Torah. Then you have angelic authors, which would be um, the Jubilees books, which I mentioned, the, the Jubilees to Abraham, the Jubilees to Moses. Uh, I believe the Jubilees to Abraham is the source of the genealogy, um, the genealogy information from Genesis. And uh, so then you have Moses' author. Some of the Torah was definitely written by Moses. Um, so the parts that were written by Moses, I believe, you know, that's one layer. Then I believe, like I said, I don't know for certain that it's Solomon, but I'm assuming it's Solomon. Uh, I think he, Solomon took some of the writings of Moses and and uh, the patriarchs and, and jubilees and put it together and created the, the Torah. So for Genesis, he took the writings of the patriarchs and the jubilees books and made the book of Genesis. For Exodus, he took the testament of Moses and made it into a, uh, a, a special book um, for the Exodus account. And for Numbers, the same thing. He used the Testament of Moses. And, um, but for Leviticus and Deuteronomy, almost the entirety of it is word for word in the originals, because of course the scribes changed it over time. But in the originals of Leviticus and Deuteronomy that Solomon produced, the vast majority of it was authored by Moses in my view. Then you have scribal slash redactor authors, and that would be after Ezra, after Ezra's time, scribes radically altered the Solomon version of the Torah, and they changed things, they added stuff in, in, in a way that was inconsistent, and I think, so you, you have the, you have the JEPD stuff, um, I think the original text of scripture was probably more like, um, it was probably like the original writings of Moses was probably just like, um, like Moses was probably the D and D was in um, Leviticus as well, in my view. Uh, the, the scholars make Leviticus into the priestly, I think, but I, I believe the original, originally Leviticus was Deuteronomic, just like uh, Deuteronomy. Um, and then I think, I think, uh, I think the whole thing with the, the divine names didn't originally exist in the Solomon version, like how it, it keeps alternating between Yahweh Elohim in a, in a very unpredict unpredictable and inconsistent way. Let's uh, let me break in just a minute. You're sure. talking about the Shapire scripts too. They don't have the sacred name except in um, an addition at the end. They're all Elohim, seven commandments. They, that seems to be a proto Torah kind of thing. You know what I'm talking about, Shapire? It, 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 yeah, it says. Uh... God or God instead instead of instead of instead of Lord our God instead of Yahweh our Elohim it says like Elohim our Elohim or something yeah. along those lines. And of course they don't know where that text came from, but they if they had it anymore they would date it very early. Go ahead. I'm sorry to have. Uh, no, that's fine. I I just think that the whole divine name like people use the divine name differentiation as one of the primary basis for J and E being separate uh, traditions. But I actually think the, that differentiation was caused by scribes redacting it. And, and um, I mean, in some ways it's similar to what they're saying with the documentary hypothesis, but it sounds like when they talk about the documentary hypothesis, it sounds like they're saying that as the book was being written, they took a J document and they took an E document and combined them together. I don't believe that. I believe the original was probably like an E document or or a B document and um, and they took that original document and 
they uh, changed the divine names inconsistently. And so their changes made it look like there's two different uh, sources here. But in reality, it's, it's one source and, and they're just randomly putting Yahweh in a bunch of different places that they feel like, oh yeah, yeah let's put Yahweh there. Let's put Yahweh here. Oh, man. Um, that's my... Uh, okay. What were you gonna say, Jackson? I'm not gonna say anything. I, I wouldn't agree with that. But... Well, You're... like I said, I, I also believe in a B, a B thing. You know what B is? Bail. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the yeah. whole thing. What was it? Well, I a lot of times that that is how is that translated, Lord or Master? Ma it would be more like Master. Uh huh. Well, you see, in in those earlier cuneiform tablets too, that name all the time. That name Baal and Ale. I'm talking about the. Um, Oh, the Ebla tablets and so forth, just loaded with those theocentric names. Well, like, for example, I mentioned this in some of my stuff before, but El Shaddai, that phrase, El Shaddai, that phrase occurs in among the Amorites, but instead of El Shaddai, they say Baal Shaddai. Baal Shaddai. Yeah. Very breasted or almighty? Um, they believe that it might actually be referring to a mountain. Um, yeah. like Shadu might be in reference to, uh, a mountain or something. That's, that's one of the, one of the theories. All like right. basically, basically Lord of the mountain, master of the mountain. And you know that in the scriptures, Yahweh has his whole special mountain that, you know, he appears to Moses on a, bur on a burning bush on a, on a special mountain. So, yeah, um, I have a lot of interesting take on the Torah. So, I plan on, I plan on making a. Uh, I'm working on. I'm, this this next year, I will be working on a preliminary version of the Bible. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take some shortcuts so I can release this to people sooner rather than later. Um, so I do plan to share with you guys that in maybe a couple of years. Uh, and you, I think you'll find that very interesting. We know what, um, Weigel? Weigel. Yeah. Yeah, remember, I don't know if you remember this or not. Maybe I was just talking to him when we were there together, there in Virginia. And he said, if, if you're going to make a series of books, the way to make money on those books is to issue them separately. And then when you <laughs> issue them all separately, then put them in one book. And he's probably right. You know, I see some of these books that come out in serial form, where you can buy like a first edition of one. The top Torah scholar, Richard Elliott Friedman. Now there's a great book he wrote, and it's called Who Wrote the Bible? Since then he's written a couple of more about certain sections. He purports to have proven that the final redactor of the Torah was Baruch, the secretary of Jeremiah. It's a good book. If anybody wants to read that, it's written for, um, it's written for lay people to read. I have that in PDF, and it, it is very good. I mean, whether you agree with him or not, his arguments are, are nearly perfect that he comes up with Baruch. And that, that very well could be, because we know that, at least we know, we think we know that the uh, Torah was put together in the Babylonian captivity, and that Baruch was there, and that we've got a couple little, we've got a letter of Baruch and a couple of number one and number two Baruch, maybe a third Baruch. It's an apocalypse. So, that's a possibility, but this fellow just doesn't get a whole lot of play in our conversation. That is Baruch, the secretary of Jeremiah, right? Well, it depends what people mean by redactor, because um, they kept, the scribes kept changing the Torah well beyond the time of Jeremiah. Like, up to the time of Messiah, they were, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls shows 
very different copies of the Torah, all at the same time period. Um, you have the traditional Masoretic text, which they have in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You have something very close to the Septuagint, something very close to the Samaritan. Sure. All of this is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then they're they have... All, uh, they're all use a prototype of some kind because none of them sure. are original and they're all different. So they're all redacted. That is editing. Redacting means simply editing. They're yes. editing earlier sources. So that implies that the redaction didn't end uh, in Jeremiah's time, but it kept going. They, they, yeah. they, the scribes kept changing things around for their different communities. Um, and then on top of that, you know, what do you, what do, you do with the Temple Scroll? Because when I, when I say you, I mean, what do these people do with the Temple Scroll? Yeah. Because um, on the one hand, if Jeremiah is the final redaction, then the, maybe the, that means the Temple Scroll has to be authentic. On the other hand, if Temple Scroll is a later version that was derived from Deuteronomy, that would mean Temple Scroll is a later redaction. So when they say, when, the, when that author says that Jeremiah's Baruch did the final redaction, that doesn't really seem to... Well, I think what he's talking about is the final redaction in in of the, the uh, in the uh, Babylonian era, or in yeah, by the by the river Shabar. Uh, the one thing that bothers me about what scholars say concerning it is that they date the Temple Scroll to first century B.C., which to me is way, way too late. Maybe that particular copy. Well, yeah, copies are different though than they're like, yeah, exactly. Different I can't than... see that the Temple Soap Scroll doesn't predate, say the Masoretic, what, what was the Masoretic text before it became the Masoretic text. And I think you pretty well proved that in your paper on the Temple Scroll, which I, I've got a copy of that if anybody wants it, I think. Mr. Carlson would probably say that's all right. And the little I've done on the actual Hebrew, um, it's the Temple Scroll is closer to the Septuagint uh, most of the time, interestingly enough. Um, but yeah, um, I do want to say, um, let's see, what was I going to say? I have to think what I'm going to say, but anyway, so we can continue. All right. Well, Emerson's got a question about <clears throat> something to introduce a Christian guide to Hebrew roots. And he says that he used Lou White's book, Fossilized Custom. There's one that's a little better than that. Ah, and I have that too. And I, for some reason, I'm not thinking of it. I used to give it out all over the place. Uh, what is the other name of the one that's less known, but Tone down, Lou. Uh, I'll find out by the end of this, and if I've got it, I'll put a link to it or something. Ah. So I would say the most ideal one for him to open would be um, uh, something called the, the, the Holy Bible, you know. The Holy Bible? Uh, yeah. No. Yeah, um, sacred name if, version. If you just read what the scriptures say, you know, and you read it with an open heart, you will see that much of what it says disagrees with uh, a lot of what Christianity has to say about many different topics. They've got one um, real stopper, and that is that Jesus came to do away with the Torah. I can't get that out of people's mind. I'm back working in the church again. I worked there for five years as a sacred musician. I'm back doing it again. And uh, the first time through, Every time I would talk about the Torah, it's always, but Jesus nailed that to the cross, or Jesus came to do away with that, or Jesus died so that we don't have to do that. That is such a stumbling block. Yeah. It, it really, does Paul say that someplace? Well, I mean, even if he does, uh, unfortunately, people's interpretation of Paul is way too high than it should be. Mm -hmm. Paul never claimed his words, all his words, that is, 
to be the word of God. Um, some of his words he did say came from a commandment of Yahweh, but uh, he, much of what he wrote was never explicitly said by him to be the word of God, but people hold it as the word of God. So if Paul said it, then it has to be true. And therefore, no matter what else scripture says on any other subject, if it contradicts what Paul clearly says, and their mind is clear, if Paul seems to be clearly saying something, then nothing else could go against it. Um, and I do know what I was going to say. Um, it was like an interesting aside based on Baruch. Um, so for Baruch, what's interesting is that, like, so many people believe Hebrew is the, like, original language of creation. We've talked about this a little bit. Um, the issue is there, there are other languages related to Hebrew, which are sort of like sister languages. So, you know, Ar Aramaic is one of them. Arabic is one of them. Ethiopian, they're all Semitic languages. And then there's something called Akkadian. And when you look at all these languages, it becomes evident that Hebrew is actually a very late language in that family. And there must have been an older Hebrew, which is the source of all those different uh, Semitic languages. Um, it, it's kind of like people saying, like, you know, you imagine you have, you imagine you have a, uh, a grandfather and you're trying to say that one of the grandparent, uh, one of the grandchildren is the ancestor. It doesn't make sense to say that a grandchild is the ancestor of the grandfather. It's the grandfather who is the source and then all his grandchildren uh, derive from him. So we basically have like Hebrew is one of the grandchildren. Aramaic is one of the grandchildren. So it's Arabic. Um, and then you have uh, oh, yeah, Ethiopian as well. But then, then you have um, Akkadian. Akkadian is basically the uncle of Hebrew. Um, it's essentially, it's, it's, a, it's one generation prior and it's, it's significantly closer to the original ancestor. But it's not a direct ancestor. There was, there was basically a few siblings of Akkadian and Hebrew comes from one of them, but they're very closely related. But so I say all that because Baruch, interestingly enough, in Akkadian, the word and name Baruch is spelled backwards. Um, this happens in different languages like Hebrew and uh, for other words. Um, over time, the dialects change and, and the, um, the letters get switched around. For example, in Hebrew, the word for sheep, one of the words for sheep, I believe, is esev. But in other parts of the Bible, the word for sheep is abes or aves. It's the same three letters, but in some verses of the Bible, it's, it's, um, it's ayin shen bet, and in other places in the Bible, it's ayin bet she, uh, excuse me, ayin bet shen. So it's the same word, just spelled differently. Um, evident that, you know, over time, language gets altered and corrupted. So what happened with Baruch, the same thing. Originally, the word for Baruch was, was um, karub, and that word derives the same root word from cherub, cherubim. Uh, you know, the angelic beings, the cherubs. Baruch originally comes from kareb, and, and uh, it basically derives from the idea of the, the, the cherubim are, are beings of blessing. Um, and so, but because Hebrew changed over time, uh, it split, it split away. And so now Baruch came into existence and it means bless 
and and the cherub now becomes a different word that loses its connection with blessing. Now people don't know that cherubs refer to blessing anymore. But in Akkadian, that connection is still uh, there. So that's uh, something that came to my mind when you were talking about Baruch. But Jeremiah's scribe would be named Baruch because in that time they were speaking Hebrew and not Akkadian. So Baruch was the word that was used by Jeremiah and people in his day. So he was named Baruch, even though if he was born a thousand years before that, he wouldn't have been named Baruch. He would have been named uh, Herob. Herob. Oh, by the way, I put up a link to the book, The Great Falling Away by Don Esposito. It goes through the history of early Christianity in a very brief way and let you know how it got off track. Unfortunately, a new one is $842, but wow. you can get a used one for $10. I think I have one here someplace, probably in PDF. I saved these PDFs. So if you some, some books you find on Amazon are way overpriced, and the problem is yeah. people on Amazon can, can charge whatever they want. So they could, they could list it for $10,000, and if someone is foolish enough to buy it, then it will be sold for $10,000. So you obviously have to be careful about that. Yeah. I sell books. So yes, I go to, to great lengths to find the least expensive one. There's a good place you can do that too, bookseller.com. It goes through all the booksellers in the entire world and finds you the least expensive copy. I'm sure I could find cheaper somewhere. Yeah, oh, you want a question? <laughs> I'm just saying, uh, it probably doesn't have every seller everywhere, but it probably has oh, most. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of them. Okay, so that was non-written documents. Going to cross that one off. What is the difference between Logos and Sophia? <laughs> I'm laughing because... Um, did you do that? Did you pick that question intentionally? No, no, that came to me. And I, all these are email questions. Because I was uh, posting about that. And, um, Seriously? Well, I wasn't. I wasn't like posting specifically about Logos and Sophia, but I was basically posting about Gnosticism recently in my uh, oh. in my Facebook group. So it's just kind of a funny coincidence. Sure. Let me answer that in one sentence. When it comes to the scripture, one is male, one is female. Their part in scripture are really the same. Sophia in the Septuagint in the Old Testament, Logos in the New. They've got the same function. They're like the son of, this is more than one sentence, the son of man, uh, one who stands between Elohim and the people of the earth and angels, somebody that can commute with both all those log logos and Sophia. For the first time in John chapter one, the logos is identified. Though that concept goes back at least to Heraclitus 500 BC in, in the Greek, we don't know as far as the scriptures. We, we see it in the Septuagint, but of course that didn't come along till about 200 BC. So they both have the same function. And if you look at John chapter 1, the prologue there, first 18 verses, you're, you'll, you'll get a pretty much the sense of what Logos is as far as the Debar, the Word. In fact, if you come to the service tomorrow morning, I'm going to be speaking about the millennium. When? And that it comes, Logos and Sophia come into that as to when. Because uh, John 1, that same prologue, predicts exactly when the Logos came to be. That is, came to be in flesh. So, see, I'm throwing in a plug for the service tomorrow. <laughs> 11 a.m., this same channel, lasts an hour. 
but I'm doing a series on millennia that you've never heard this material before. And uh, I'm going to give out tomorrow uh, a sheet. So if you want, you can, once you listen to this, you can give it to your friend that will explain it succinctly as to when it is. So I mentioned it's third in the series. The first two I did was what and who. This one's when. There's going to be how and why. So that's my advertisement. Okay, oh, the advertisement is a British one. <laughs> so let me share my take on the. Please do. So, first of all, I believe Logos is the sun, and the sun is in S O N. And then uh, Sophia, I believe, is the mother, the, the divine mother, the Holy Spirit. And um, so I want to speak about um, Gnosticism for a second. And I want to share with you guys my take on it because I think, well, you know, as I said, I made a Facebook post recently and maybe some people read it and uh, were concerned or uh, didn't understand what I was trying to say. You, know. you are pretty naughty, really, when it comes oh, yeah. down to it. Oh, that's true, yeah. I'll but, have um, to, I need to tell a story about you sometime during this session. All right. Don't forget Not it. right now. Okay. All right. So basically, here's the deal. Here's what we have. Um, so, so I, there are certain uh, terms used in Gnostic texts, um, which are distinctly Gnostic sounding. You have pler plerima, you have archons, you have, you know, you have different words like that. You have so logos, and then you have yaldabaoth, you have uh, sackcloth. Octoa. Lots what, 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 of strange terms. Yeah, and then there's also semael, um, or semel. So Samel is from Hebrew, and that means that means a blind god or poisonous god or god of poison. Um, Yaldabaoth comes from Aramaic, according to scholars. I think it comes from Aramaic, and it means son of chaos. The the first part, son. You would say, wait, I thought son is bar or ben. That's true, but there's another word which basically means son, but not quite. It means more like child. Uh, and it's yal, yalda or yalad. And um, you will see that in the Hebrew Bible. Um, for example, places so-and-so begot so-and-so, like uh, uh, Adam begot Seth. It uses the word yalad. Uh, so, and it basically means produce as an offspring, a child. So Yalda Baoth is child of chaos or son of chaos. So that's where that term comes from. Say it again. Uh, child of chaos. Uh, uh -huh. Yalda Baoth. Uh huh. Yalda Baoth. Son of what? Son of chaos. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. And um, so you have certain Gnostic sounding terms like plerima and other things. The interesting thing is those same terms are used in the writings of Paul. Um, he uses those same terms, at least in the Greek text of Paul. Another thing that's very interesting is I, you know, I'm very much an Apocrypha minded guy. And there's a lot of documents of the Apocrypha which say very similar things to Gnostic things. Um, one of the ideas in Gnosticism is the Messiah laughing um, on yeah. the cross or yeah. around the time of the cross. And the, I have found several different documents of the Apocrypha saying that same exact teaching. There's, there's also, there's all kinds of different, um, teachings that sound very Gnostic and yet are found in regular Apocryphal texts. But I found something even more interesting, um, is that there is one or two documents in particular and they're from Egypt. They're in the Coptic Egyptian language. 
these documents um, are orthodox in the sense that they are very much Christian writings. And yet it uses the Gnostic terms that are not used in any of the Apocrypha texts um, besides the Gnostic uh, Nag Hammadi. It uses Yaldabaoth in these documents uh, for Satan. It, it uses uh, the term... Uh, it, it actually, in, in, the, in the documents, it says Saklebeoth. Saklebeoth. So whoever made... Who, who, which, whichever scribe was working on that text um, combined the two different names. Saklos, which I told you, Saklos, uh, th that means a fool. And they took it and combined it with Yaldabaoth, and so it became Saklebeoth. And in you these better explain who that is, by the way, besides Satan. That, that is the creator, according to them, an evil... According to the yeah, Gnostics, it's, yeah. it's, the, it's the creator. According to these orthodox documents, it's referring to, 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 to the devil. Uh, yeah, those are Coptic documents? Manichaean or Christian? Uh, no, uh, co it's Christian uh, Coptic documents, um, but with very, with like Gnostic, certain, certain things that might be called Gnostic, and yet it's in the orthodox context. Is this in like the Nag Hammadi library or where, where do you find it? No, it's, um, they're newly translated uh, oh. into English. Um, so the two documents I'm referring to are the, they're called the enthronement of Michael, the archangel, and the enthronement of Gabriel, the archangel. Okay. And in those texts, it also uses a, a name for Satan that you find elsewhere only in Jubilees in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It uses Mastima, interestingly. Uh, and it uses Samael in these uh, two documents I mentioned. So they're like Dead Sea Scroll names. Yeah. So it's interesting. It has the Dead Sea Scroll names. It has the Gnostic names. Um, so with, with some of this evidence being put together, I believe it makes a lot of sense to me that Yeshua, when he was doing his teachings, some of his teachings were secret teachings, and I believe Yeshua did highly mystical, symbolic teachings to his apostles, and he taught them about Logos, Sophia, and all kinds of, of high terminology. And then later generations took what Yeshua said and twisted it slightly and created a false system. So there's two things here which are very compelling as like a step approach from one to the next. And that is Paul refers to Satan. You know, Paul throughout his letters, he refers to the father as God. He refers to the son as divine and the son of God. And he basically sticks to what, you know, the overall scripture says in a sense that he doesn't, Paul doesn't really teach the Gnostic view that the world is evil and created by an evil being, right? Paul doesn't say that. But what Paul does say in a few places of his letters, or at least letters attributed to him, he refers to Satan as the God of this world. And I think that phrase is significant, and I believe that that's the source of the evil Gnosticism. I believe that the Messiah taught something similar, that Satan was the god of this world, and that, oh, Satan's the god of this world, and the, the god of this world created, uh, created us, therefore, the god of this world is Satan. So they took the original Satan reference, and shifted it to Yahweh because both Yahweh and Satan are called God, but in different contexts. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is, um, let's see. Uh, what was so, the second one of those? The enthronement of Michael is one. I found that one. What was the And other? Gabriel. Gabriel. Okay. Um, Let's see, what was I saying? Um, let's 
Sorry, I, I lost my train of thought for a all second. Right. Um, no, I actually lost it before you interrupted, so it's all okay. good. Um, basically, um, so I said there was confusion with the God of this world language. And then the other thing is who created us or what created us, who created us? Most people say uh, the Father created us or some people say the Trinity or the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all played a part. I actually believe, thinking about it more, I think there's reason to believe that the angels participated in the creation process and that it wasn't just the Father, you Son, and Holy Spirit. You are I think, <laughs> I think the angels helped out. And so if the angels helped out, that would mean that Satan himself helped out in the creation process. So you have Satan as the God of this world. You have Satan as one of the creators. Therefore, the Gnostics took the teachings of Yeshua about Satan and twisted it and said, oh, you see, the Messiah said right here that he's, that he's the God of this world. Satan is the God of this world. And Satan is the creator. Therefore, Yahweh is evil. They did those jumps, I, I believe. And, and so they twisted what Messiah's original teachings were talking about. And now you have Gnosticism is this evil system. Um, the reason I've come to that conclusion is there's so many agreements in these Orthodox Apocrypha documents. And when I say Orthodox, I mean documents which do not teach the world is evil and the God is evil. Um, but there's so many things in those documents which agree with Gnostic things that it, it's evident to me that the only way to explain it is that if the Gnostic writings and these Apocrypha writings come from a common source, and what would that common source be? That would be Yeshua himself in his original teachings. And then over time, the Gnostics took those original teachings and twisted it to their God is evil, um, Yahweh is evil interpretation. And then the Christians took and derived it from the original and they produced a, a more faithful version, but twisted in some ways to be um, more uh, Christian sounding than the original Jewish roots of the faith. Sorry for that. You uh, are a heretic. Sorry for that rambling. And uh, I know I, I, I should have made that clear by now. Yeah. Except you're a different Gnostic every six months. I mean, a different. There you go. Got a different religion every six months, but that's all right. Keeps that keeps everything kind of interesting. We should always be uh, seeking truth and modifying what we believe based on new evidence. Sometimes we might go back and forth um, because it might be a, a difficult subject, and someone might show you something compelling that convinces you at the time and then new evidence comes and you're like, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. So you go back and forth sometimes. Let me see. I couldn't, Did I couldn't find that enthronement of the Archangel Gabriel. I found Michael, several versions of that. If, uh, they're, if, if they're, you happen to find a link to that. They're both there. Um, I, I would, uh, you, you, both of them should be taken from Sisic, Q or some whatever his name yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, you. Uh, Sick you. Uh -huh. I think I don't remember how you spell it, but uh, he has both on his website. Um, okay, so the question is from Vicky: What about human beings? Humans being gods also is it the same line of thought? Well, humans did not participate in the creation process, but. Um, I believe that, you know, in the scripture, Yahweh says to Moses that he would be God to Pharaoh. Uh, and basically there's evidence that God essentially just means, in the original scripture sense, it means someone with authority over something else, an authority over, like a natural authority. 
Um, no, I don't believe it actually means mighty one. Some people believe uh, Emerson ask if it means a God means mighty one. You'll see that definition thrown around a lot, but I believe from what I've seen that it doesn't mean mighty one. It means like, um, it means something almost identical to king and lord, but it's a slight nuance. Um, so it basically, like for example, you have the sun. An angel is appointed over the sun to um, oversee the, the uh, aspects of the sun. So it's the overseeing aspect in a authoritative sense. So an angel is appointed over the sun, and that becomes the god of the sun. The what was it? Uh, somebody's calling me. Oh, okay. It'll be um, gone in a second. Pardon me, Oh no. Sure. Uh, uh, when I asked that question, I was thinking what you said, what you were saying about uh, Satan being the god of this world. And right. that, that made me think about um, when Yeshua said, quoted um, scripture and said, don't you know that you are gods? Know you not that you are gods? Right. So in what, what sense would that statement or, or what level of quote unquote gods would that be? It's not really God, it's Elohim, divine, so, divine beings. So, so from, from my perspective, basically, I understand the word God or the concept of God to originally be almost identical to king, but more like a, a supernatural king, if you will, a spiritual king over something, a phenomena where you have, you know, like, like, for example, the pagans have the god of thunder, the god of wind, the god of whatever, you know, there's a god of over each part of nature. In the same way, how are angel, or how are humans made to be gods? I believe humans, you know, scripture says humans were made in the image of the gods, the image of the gods. Um, and or the image of the Elohim, uh, they were made in the divine image. And so um, being made in that image, we were all also put as, a, as an authority over the whole world. So humans, what are they told? Be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion over the earth and everything in it. Um, the animals, the plants, the, the earth itself, the waters. Humans are to be the ultimate rulers, masters, controllers, kings of the entire earth and everything in it. And that makes them gods in that sense. Another sense that scripture seems to use, there's some apocryphal documents which use this. Uh, gods also can refer to rulers of the people such as a king or a judge who basically, for example, absolute monarchs who basically it's their way or the highway type of thing, absolute monarchs or who, or m monarchs or rulers who have a high level of authority and you have to do what they say or else they can exercise harsh judgment against you. Those are basically gods over you because they have power over you if you want to go to the power definition of, you know, mighty ones, they have power over you. Um, so if you go with that mighty one definition, um, angels appointed over different phenomena have power over different parts of nature. Um, so humans will be called gods in that sense of being appointed over something to control something as underneath them. And, um, but I would say all angels are gods because they're all appointed over for a specific natural phenomena which they are to control. Uh, 
that's, that's what I would say about uh, that. Um, but I've been talking enough. So Jackson, why don't you uh, do a uh, a new question? Unless people have anything right. they want to ask uh, about what we said. Well, I just happened to see that you had put up uh, a notice about flat earth. Is that outside of our purview here? No, we can. Because uh, you about said that. you changed your mind, and I always thought flat earth kind of fell flat. I, I mean, uh, why, why don't you tell me a little bit about well, where you're at on there? So I've never actually believed in flat earth, but I, for many years, I was believing in geocentrism. Uh -huh. Now, they kind of overlap, and you could actually call flat earth geocentrism they're basically like kind of like part of the same group, but I believed in the sphere version of geocentrism um, for many years. Now, the reason I did is because you were, you were, we are basically, the way we're told these things is that we kind of left with two choices, kind of like, you know, you say you have to vote Republican or Democrat. Both, both options are horrible in my view. Some people would disagree with that, but in my view, both options our um, Republican and Democrat contradict the ethical principles of scripture. So it's, it's you're, you're forced to choose between two evils that not, neither is a good answer. Um, in a similar way, you have geocentrism and heliocentrism, and they both have major problems. The major issue with heliocentrism, which pushed me towards geocentrism, is the fact that it says that... Um, According to heliocentric theory, by you know most most uh, people who do the theory, the universe is billions of years old, and and um, certain stars are light years away. Those statements, if they are true, they are completely irreconcilable with scripture in a way that seems too different. It's so different that it seems like the whole essence of scripture is completely thrown out if we come to that conclusion. So you, you feel like if you believe heliocentrism, you're forced to throw out the scriptures. And we don't want to throw out the scriptures, so we feel compelled to go to the other direction, geocentrism. And something to keep in mind, they could not prove geocentrism false until very modern times. You know, and some people still think it hasn't been proven false, but it was acknowledged by opponents of geocentrism that it could not be proven false up until the um, time basically of the printing press 500 years ago. And, and then new discoveries started being made. And um, so the issue is for geocentrism and heliocentrism, geo means the sun and everything goes Move around the earth. The geo earth. Helio is the sun. Everything goes around the sun. Well, up until like the 1500s, we were pretty much stuck in our uh, solar system, if you will, or whatever you want to call it. We were very close, but we started looking beyond our system, and we started seeing that other things are not lining up if geocentrism is true and and um for example you know how we all say today yeah there are many many different galaxies did you know i i did this research recently that only until um it was only 1920 when they came to conclude that there's other galaxies besides the one we are in right now. So for the entirety of history, up until the last 100 years, we, everyone believed that there was only one galaxy. So the, a lot of the beliefs that we have today are very new. That's because new advancements in technology are being made that made research possible that was not priorly possible. For example, they have built something called the Hubble Telescope. It's a humongous telescope. 
and they put it outside the Earth's orbit, or not the Earth's orbit, basically they put it outside the Earth's atmosphere. So this telescope is in space right now, and it has a very strong um, ability to see things. If it was on Earth, the atmosphere would cloud the vision and make it hard to really make things out. But because we put it way up there and the atmosphere is not clouding it, we get a lot more clear uh, images. And those clear images provide a, a lot more evidence against geocentrism. Um, the basic, the biggest problem with geocentrism is the fact that the universe is so big that in order for geocentrism to be true, the entire universe would have to go around the earth once a day. And that just becomes impossible. Once we, we didn't, we didn't know until like a few hundred years ago, how big the universe was. I mean, we still don't know, but we thought it was much smaller. Once we found out it was way bigger than we thought it was, suddenly geocentrism doesn't work anymore because the whole universe could not travel fast enough to go around the earth every day. But the earth spinning once a day is far more plausible. And that would explain how the entire universe seems to go around us every day because the earth's moving. And um, there's a bunch of other stuff that I've been looking at, which provides some compelling evidence that heliocentrism is true. But what about the issue I said before, where if heliocentrism is true, then according to current heliocentrism, that means the, the world universe is billions of years old. Basically, what I've discovered is that pretty much in the solar system, the measurements we have are very reliable for heliocentrism. Beyond that, it starts getting unreliable because they start making so many assumptions and speculations. They start trying to guess how far away stars are based on uh, different principles that are not always clearly true. So, um, so I believe the universe is young, uh, less than 6,000 years old, because that's what scripture says. And I find it very hard to believe that the, that the universe could be billions of years old. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, so, I think um, until they can prove, could provide much more compelling evidence in a way that I can understand that the universe is as old as they say it is, then I'm going to continue uh, believing that the universe is young and simply I'll accept heliocentrism for the closer things in space, like the, um, uh, the uh, galaxy we're in, basically. But beyond that, I think it's, it's, we don't really know. We don't really know, I think. The fact, if you, look, if you pay attention to the news of science, every few years or every decade, they come out with a news article that says, we were wrong about the age of the Earth, or we were wrong about the age of the universe. It's actually this number of billion years off than what, what we had actually told you guys. You'll see that news story. I've seen that multiple times in my life um, where they've changed by many, many, many years how old the Earth or the universe is, which shows that their measurements are not reliable enough if they could be that far off. So, um, but yeah, I, I would have to do another video or something to give like a full in-depth analysis of the evidence for heliocentrism against geocentrism. And I'm just kind of learning some of this stuff because it's new to me. And it's, I'm not, I'm not really comfortable with this idea. Um, I much rather prefer geocentrism, but I kind of have to admit when I'm wrong. And I, I just cannot reconcile the evidence with geocentrism any longer. I have to, I am compelled to believe in heliocentric model based on the scientific evidence that has come to me. And the former evidence I thought proved geocentrism, I have now come to see actually makes a lot of sense in heliocentrism. The thing is, it just needs to be explained well to you. It's, these things are very complicated things. And if it's not explained well, it's hard to understand. But if someone 
explains it step by step and says, this is why, here's the evidence for it, then the evidence becomes much uh, easier to accept once it's fully explained for you. Hey, Onya, have you, have yeah. you ever been to Rob Skiba's stuff? Um, not in depth, but I'm familiar with some of his stuff. He's got hundreds of hours and goes into all that stuff. But here's one interesting question and is what one that caught me, you know, when we have our Genesis one creation, you know, to have a heliocentric that normally comes from a big bang theory, which came from a certain Jesuit professor, um, uh, a French one, exactly. I, I forgot what his name was, but it was a big problem with the Roman Catholic church you know, coming up with this theory, um, because if the earth was created in the beginning and he did all these, you know, these things on day one, day two, on the third day, he had the trees, you know, all the seed bearing, you know, trees and fruit and the grass. Well, and then on the fourth day created two lights. So what was the earth doing before just kind of sitting out there and oh there's the sun so oh, let me go start floating around the sun now you know that goes against the genesis one creation so when he says he stuck those lights in the firmament are we going to call genesis a liar well i would say that um it's not necessarily a liar because um genesis actually never claims to be the word of god um Jubilees, on the other hand, does claim to be, like, you know, it, it claims to be the angels talking and saying this is the way it is. Um, but at least for Genesis, it never actually claims to be what Yahweh or God actually said. It, it basically, it, it could be whoever wrote it, it could be their understanding based on scriptures, but also based on their own personal understanding. Um, oh, is our own personal understanding that the creation account of Genesis is accurate? I hold to the creation account being accurate, but I, I wouldn't. Accurate. I wouldn't say that the if the author is wrong that they lied, because I believe lying is more knowing. You know it's wrong type of thing. Um, I, I think um, it's a good uh, a good issue you bring up. But another thing you bring, you know. How were there days before the sun? Because days are determined by the sun in our current system. Um, but Genesis chapters one to three, I'm not verse uh, the first three days. Excuse me, the first three days before the sun is created. Apparently had days, but how did that happen? Um, okay, well, we'll eliminate the days of the fact there was an Earth, and then the Earth was doing something, and then now all of a sudden there's a sun. And then what the earth just decided to start floating around the sun you know that's just well a day, a day according to the heliocentric a day is just a rotation so the earth would just be rotating but gotcha. um in my prior system of geocentrism the earth was in the center of the universe and everything else the whole universe was revolving around and each heaven some scriptures say there's seven heavens and each heaven would be distant from the center of the universe but I now have a different view. I have the opposite view. I now think the Earth and the galaxy it's part of is in the very outskirts of the universe, the very near the end of the universe. And then in the center is God himself. God himself is in the very center of the universe. And that makes a lot more sense to me from a, from a, a divine perspective. You would, it would make sense for um, the ultimate divine being being in the center of the universe and everything revolving around God, everything revolving. So, so uh, all the galaxies would go around um, the center of the universe god himself uh and um also to keep in mind heliocentrism model the sun and stars appear to not move um like they appear to be stationary but the truth is 
that if the Earth is moving around the sun and the planets are going around the sun, the sun and the stars in our galaxy are going around the center of the galaxy. And then the galaxies are going around the center of bigger super galaxies, if you will. And then those are going around the entire universe. The whole universe is revolving. And then the smaller things are revolving. Oh, and one of the things that's also convincing me of, of heliocentrism is the fact that planets have moons. And these moons are going around these planets. Like Jupiter has moons going around um, Jupiter. How can this be explained? Well, Jupiter is spinning, is rotating, and the rotating force is pulling the moon and keeping it in orbit around the planet. That's how, why our moon is going around us. And that's why the Earth and the planets are going around the sun, because the sun is actually spinning too. The scientists have evidence that the sun is spinning. And, and uh, so everything's spinning and the spinning movement is causing everything to revolve. And all the revolving is like making the entire universe go around. Yep. You might want to check out this documentary called The Principle. It's with all of our great scientists right now. And they've all now coming to the conclusion. They said, we have a, a problem. It says 10th to the 10,000th degree that we've been swipe, uh, sweeping under the rug for the last 50 years. And it is that they have now all, they are all starting to come to the conclusion that the, we are a geocentric and it's called the principle. You can get it on Amazon. You can, I'm sure you can get it on other things, but it's got all our top scientists now coming out and saying, well, there's a problem we haven't been able to uh, answer. And here it is. And they explain it's pretty good. Um, very, it's called the principle, a really worthwhile watch. Yeah, uh, that, definitely. You want to you, you want to post that? Um, principle. You, yes, the principle. I'll put the put the link up, would you? Yeah. Nope. Do you not do you not have a Facebook? Nope. Okay. Don't tell them why, John. <sighs> I think Everybody I already know why. You. I think I already know why. Um, <laughs> I think the same reason you and I didn't for a while, probably. Man, I, 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 I frequented uh, Facebook jail a whole lot. Mm. So then I, and then after, I just finally got tired of dealing with it. And then I, um, after a couple of years, I just, I just shut my account down. So I did. And I felt, you know, a couple of years later, oh, let me start another account. When I, you know, joined the Yahad, and I was like, I think it would be good for me to start another account. When I tried to go on, it recognized all my email addresses and everything. And it said, uh, do to your content, you are banned. I'm not gonna lifetime ban, so I <laughs> uh, oh, just get yourself a VPN and a new free email address. And you're if you really want to, if you really want to, but you, like some people just don't want to be on Facebook, and that's okay too, you know. But uh, mm -hmm. but I do like Facebook, but yeah, I know what you mean. Um, so well, I'll have to check that stuff out. But like I said, up until recently, like the last few years, I was a definite geocentrist. A geocentrist. But for me, it's just, at least from what I've seen the last few days, um, I'm pretty much convinced that heliocentrism too is true. Now, I did want to say one other thing about that. Book of Enoch says that the stars, sin, uh, certain stars sinned by going off their orbits. And that's why we have the planets. So I accept Enoch as scripture. So how does that reconcile? Um, so what I believe is that um, some planets were commanded by, uh, by God to be in that orbit, but other stars were commanded to be in the star position. But some of the stars abandoned their star positions and gravitated, they, they moved towards, um, they moved around other places. And because they moved contrary to the orbits that were assigned to them, they were punished and they, their glory was robbed from them.
and they basically became planets and they were forced into a orbit as a punishment for them abandoning their what was assigned to them. So I know it might sound a little bit um, convoluted, but uh, I think that that's a way that could reconcile what uh, Enoch says and with heliocentrism. In other words, I don't think heliocentrism is entirely incompatible uh, with what Enoch says. I don't think it's incompatible, but it definitely, like, geocentrism, geocentrism is easier to match with what Swiffer says, but I think it can reconcile with heliocentrism in a way that is not too contrived. I think I, I can reconcile in a way that um, is still harmonious and still faithful to integrity, in my opinion. Uh, looks like we're getting close to the end here. Um, yeah, just enough time for one more, and I have sure. one for you if you'd like. Which chapter is the center of the Bible? Wouldn't that depend on what Bible you use? <laughs> Uh, they, you know, like I, Psalm 47 or something. Yeah, something like that. But no, I, you, <laughs> okay, you know me. I'm going to go get my Bible right now. And we'll... Yeah, get your Bible and count and count uh, each page and see which is the middle for us. How, why don't you do that? Um, I, uh, of course, I don't believe that the Bible is the full Bible. Uh, as it's originally. So the middle of the Bible, to me, that's a non, it's like a, um, it's like saying, um, I don't know, it's like saying, um, well, I'll put it. what, what, what color is the song so and so, or, you know, something weird like that. Like, so I have a Bible here. It's a uh, revised standard version with the Apocrypha at the end. <laughs> well, that's going to change it. Yes, it is. It, it opens at Jeremiah 50. Insofar and as I can tell, but I, I don't have one right here with the Apocrypha in the middle. Septuagint versus uh, Masoretic. Very different because Masoretic has chronicles at the end. It has the writings at the end. Yeah. Septuagint. Septuagint has the pro prophets at the end, so everything is in a different order. Well, um, like wasn't the Chronicles, isn't that the last book that came into the canon? Well, that's what the, that's what the uh, that's what many scholars would would say. Paralipomenon, I think. Well, that, I, I don't I don't fully agree with that, but uh, that's what a lot of scholars would say. Okay. Um, oh, one other thing, basically, you know, talking about Chronicles and stuff, and the the thing is. When you start looking at like Daniel and Ezra and Nehemiah and trying to compare it with what history says, there are some major contradictions in a way that I'm pretty convinced that the history, in some aspects, history is more correct because they get names wrong in the Bible. Like they're, they're saying names wrong. Like, um, for example, Daniel says Nebuchadnezzar when it's actually Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, the evidence overwhelmingly from history indicates that it's Nebuchadnezzar that's being talked about, and yet Daniel says it's Nebuchadnezzar. And you have other examples like that, like Esther, uh, not Esther, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. It's like the chronology doesn't make sense. Um, right. So, but, and another thing, like, so Ezra and Nehemiah have a couple, like, Ezra has a couple Artaxerxes, and a Ahasuerus, which would be Xerxes. Um, it's like, it's, there's a reference to Xerxes randomly in one verse, and then it goes away, and you don't hear from it again. Um, but then... In Josephus, the entirety is Xerxes. It's not our Xerxes, it's just Xerxes. But for Esther, the Hebrew for Esther says Ahasuerus or Xerxes, 
-hmm. And the Septuagint and Josephus says Artaxerxes. So how is there a discrepancy like that? Because they're both the same, according to what I've read. They're both the same. No? Weak. I think, weak. So. I think it's a, I think it's a weak uh, defense. Yeah, not saying you, not saying you're you're a weak. Yeah, I understand. It's like they say uh, the son of Nebuchadnezzar is Belshazzar. When we know it's not, he's like a grand grandson. Right. Or it, it's possible they're not even related. It's possible they're not even related. Um, the father of Belshazzar is uh, Nabonidus, like I mentioned, mm -hmm. Nabonidus. Yeah. Now, aren't they the same? That's another thing. You look up uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and you see that it equates to Nabonidus, Nabonidus. Same person. Maybe they're uh, just using that as uh, an excuse. I saw, what I saw was that they're different people and that Nebuchadnezzar is the original name yeah. and that Nebuchadnezzar is a distortion of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, okay, at this point I have to put an end to it because our time is up and I've got to fit this into a certain time space. That is why I should have this up on YouTube tomorrow. This is going to be very interesting if we're able to put the chat up too. There's enough room there. Yeah. I got to get, uh, I got to know whether it's okay with everybody if we put the chat up there. I don't see anybody's last name, I don't think. But then you're going to see your last name if it's on your Zoom account. So uh, anybody don't want to do that? Okay. Jackson, uh, you could stop recording now. I just have one thing, one other thing to say. Go ahead and say it. I'll just speed this up a little bit. Okay. All I was going to okay. say is that um, in Jeremiah, both Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar occurs. And obviously, Nebuchadnezzar is the correct version of the name. And scribes later on changed it to Nebuchadnezzar. So mm -hmm. that's evidence. And there's much other evidence elsewhere that scribes monkeyed with scripture and added names, altered names, and so scripture in many ways could be wrong in different places. Yep. Next week, if you're up late, you can hear the replay of these on Hebrew Nation Radio. So I think that comes on. It's on the West Coast at 11 o'clock. But over here, 2 in the morning. You're going to put the heresy on the... All the heresy on here. You know, they've already <laughs> threatened me for six years. They're going to kick me off. I don't suppose they are now. I mean... <laughs> Yeah. Well, they'd have kicked me off by now. So thank you all for coming, and may Yahweh bless you very much through the rest of this week. I hope this was exciting. It certainly was for me. I learned a lot. We could just turn it on and let uh, let Onia talk. Well, I want to do more of you and you talking next time. Oh, okay. great. This is kind of your turn. So I appreciate it. Appreciate you all being here. Talk to you next Friday. Shalom, guys.